Hey, it's Jason here from Fraser Valley Rose Farm. This video I'm going to make today is on your roses from head to toe. What I wanted to do is take you through a top to bottom description of your roses uh, to describe the botanical parts and the parts that I use in order to do my propagation. So uh, uh, hang tight and I'll start with the flowers. Alright, I'm going to start with the flowers because I know it's the, uh, it's the showy part of the rose and most people won't stick around to the end of the video for the less uh, for the less exciting parts of the rose. So for the flowers, I wanted to start by showing you the difference between a, a solitary flowering rose and a cluster flowering rose. This one here flowers solitary. That's what you're used to seeing in a florist sponge is a rose that's just on its own with no other roses on the stem. By contrast, I want to show you this one here. You can see this is cluster flowering. So on the same stem here, you have the central bloom, but you also have all these other blooms coming. So it doesn't bloom as a single, it blooms as a flush of flowers. The next thing I want to show you is to do with petal count. Now your wild roses, and this is not a wild rose, this is bread, but your wild roses have one, two, three, four, five petals. That's what they call a single rose. Now the classifications have gone up from there, where what they actually do, there's somebody whose job is actually this, is to tear apart roses and count the number of petals in there. So they go from single like this, up to this one here, is probably what they would describe as semi-double. It has more than five, but probably less than 10 petals on it. The next classification after that is double. And I wonder, I wonder if this one is double. If that's not double, which uh, double takes you up to about 25 petals, then it's probably full, which takes you through from 26 to 40 petals. And then there's ones that have a lot more petals than that. I don't have them in bloom in my garden right now, uh, but way earlier in the season, a lot of the old garden roses from Europe, the centifolias and the, the really heavy flowering ones, have tons and tons of petals in that. And they go past full, they call it very full, uh, imaginatively. So that's the, uh, the petal count conversation. Um, next thing I'll talk about really quickly here, and again, I don't have all the examples here, but they do classify by shape of bloom. So this one here, is a shape that they would call globular. And you can see kind of why. It's kind of the, the shape of a globe that's rounded. Uh, other ones they might describe more as cupped. And then other ones still they might describe as open or quartered or other examples like that. I'm not going to give you them all here, but just to give you an idea that they do classify rose blooms by their shape. And that's something that you can use a discussion of, of roses. Um, the next one I'm going to talk about is color. And um, just really quickly here, the natural color of roses in the wild tends towards white, pink, and yellow. And later on, breeders came in and they bred in all sorts of different variations in the color. So uh, lots of pinks, lots of purples, yellows, whites, and they started mixing those together. And uh, what they ended up with is just a, a wide range of colors all the way through the spectrum. The one color that does not exist naturally in a rose, so if you see this being sold on the internet uh, as a blue rose, it's either something that is transgenic or it's something that they've photoshopped or doesn't exist. Um, there are colors that they try to sell as blue that are more uh, mauve or uh, a, a light purple or that kind of thing, but blue doesn't exist in roses. Another one that unqualifiedly does not exist in roses is those ones you see sold on, on the internet that look like rainbows. Uh, that, uh, that kind of pattern doesn't exist in roses and the blue doesn't exist in roses. So probably what they've done there is either they've photoshopped it or they've taken a white rose, they've cut the bottom of the stem and stuck it into dye and they've made those colors come through the rose. So that's your natural variations of color in roses. And uh, while we're here talking about the roses, I thought I would take you on the flower here to show you a couple of other parts. So what we're accustomed to talking about on the rose is the petals here, but there's other parts that you should know about. 
So right behind the pedals here, this part here is called the sepals. And sometimes in bud, those can be quite ornamental um, with these kind of fringes on the end of the sepal. Okay, so I noticed in editing that my part of the flower that was talking about the internal parts of the flower uh, was a little out of focus. So I'm hoping to do a little bit better with this take here. And what I'll show you is that I've removed the petals on this flower here. This outside ring of yellow there, that's called the stamen of the flower. And that's the male part of the flower. It holds the pollen. And the part in the center there, the more reddish center of the flower, is the female part where the pollen gets deposited by bees after they've visited the flower. So if you've transferred the pollen from hopefully a different flower than this one onto the stigma, then what will happen is the seeds will begin to develop. And they do so inside of the area right behind the flower. That, uh, that area there begins to swell. And so what I'll show you next is the, the hips of the flowers as they've developed after being pollinated. Okay, moving right along to the hips, which is what the roses do too after they've flowered. Uh, you can see that the, the hips have the same kind of variation in bloom form as the flowers and that these two both flowered in clusters and then directly after that turned into the heads or the hips. You can see here that the fruit of the rose still has the sepals on it, still has biologically all the same parts, but now the fertilized seed inside of it has developed. This one here, you can tell by the color, is orange now, is actually ripened. So what's inside of it should be actual seeds. And you can see there that they have turned into seeds now. So that's the role of the hip in your garden. And two things that it's useful for for you is that it can be quite ornamental and also that it creates those uh, seeds so that the next generation of roses can be bred. Um, in addition to that, the hips provide good food for wildlife, so birds and small animals uh, uh, nibble at the hips. Uh, the fleshy part is uh, is just uh, like fruity and mushy, and uh, and people can so even people sometimes turn that into jams or or preserves, uh, high in vitamin C. But as I say, for ornamental purposes, that's kind of neat to look at, and you can get actually some other cool shapes. Like this one here is the urn-shaped hip of Rosa moesii, and this one here is the chestnut-shaped or textured hip of Rosa roxburghii. So that's kind of neat. And uh, next I'm going to move on and tell you about the stems of your roses. And that's important to us because I use the stems for propagation. Okay, it would be weird to say that stems are my favorite part of the rose, but they're certainly the part of the rose that I know the best and I work with the closest in propagating roses. So I want to show you the difference, first of all, between softwood, semi-hardwood, and hardwood. You can see that this is the brand new growth of a rose and how purple it is. That's pretty characteristic of the roses. They send up this soft supple. Here's something cool. I can take this, I could bend it, I could probably even tie it in a knot. That is softwood. Now, I don't do softwood rose propagation, but if I did, take cuttings off of a softwood part of the rose, you'd see just by how lush that is, just by how green and, and soft it is and wet it is, that it would be very easy to dry this piece out. And so you really have to be careful if you're trying to propagate with softwood. I don't even try it. The one I go with here is called semi-hardwood. And you can see this one here has matured a little bit more. And by the time you get back here, it's still soft. By the time you get here, it's starting to get to the point that if I bent it too far, it might snap. That's a great softwood section for taking, or sorry, semi-hardwood semi section for taking cuttings. 
um, and cut above a node and cut below a node and I'll go over that in just a second but that is a semi hardwood section and without even pausing a little bit here if you go way further down on the stem you're gonna find the hardwood portion and hardwood is so firm that I can't really bend it without it buckling or cracking or uh, or breaking or snapping on me so that's uh, that's hardwood and I do hardwood cuttings and I do semi hardwood cuttings um, this isn't my cutting video but uh, that's an important part to me so the next thing I want to show you on the stem here is that every place where a leaf emerges from the stem that is called a node and I got one and I've got two three four and five nodes here one near the top one near the bottom every place that one of those leaves comes out and I'll go through the leaves in just a minute here is also a place where the rose can regenerate that's where it has its buds that's where it would initiate the growth for either a flower or for a new shoot so that's what the uh, what the uh, buds look like okay this is something very basic so I apologize if I'm uh, if I'm talking down I really don't mean to but this is a leaf this here this is not a leaf that is a leaflet only if it attaches to the stem the whole thing that is the leaf each of these is just a part of the leaf so when people say pull off a leaf and try to propagate with the part below the leaf they're not talking about this little midrib on the leaf they're not talking they're talking about the stem um, this here is a full leaf and that part there is just a leaflet the leaves can come in a bunch of different shapes and sizes like this one here well as for color this one is sort of a grayish uh, almost purplish looking leaf that's from Rosa Glauca so it can have a different look to it um, you can also notice that it has a different leaf count so this one here has two four six seven leaflets on the leaf other ones on uh, on this one here for instance this one has seven uh, some of them have five um, and even closer up to the to the blooming end of the rose they can have only three leaves on on modern hybrid roses other ones like this one here have nine so that's uh, two four six eight nine that has nothing to do with its stage of growth that's just that this is a different species of rose and you see it's distinctive and it has smaller leaves and toothed leaves that's from a Scots rose so uh, different roses have different leaf counts now when they talk about doing pruning on roses and deadheading on roses oftentimes they'll refer to um, prune back to the next leaf set that has five on it obviously this one has nine to begin with so you'd want to go down to um, in fact you wouldn't deadhead a Scots rose so they're really talking about those hybrid roses and uh, on those you would pull, pull, pull back down to a five leaf leaf set now the goal of deadheading is when I talked about the benefits of having those rose hips in your garden well that's the benefits the the downside of having rose hips in your garden is that when the rose starts putting energy into growing rose hips what it isn't doing is putting energy into blooming again so uh, if you uh, want to deadhead your rose choose count back down to the part where the rose is still um, vegetatively growing and you can tell that by having a leaf set that has five leaflets on it and cutting at the node above that okay following the stems down the plant I'm gonna take you to the part called the bud union now that could also be considered the crown of the plant and that's where all of these uh, stems reach and make this this sort of swollen area right where the plant reaches the ground where it all emerges now actually when I say it meets the ground it actually could be a little above that some people plant their bud union a little bit higher and some people plant them a little bit lower uh, but it is the swollen part of the plant that's right where all of these uh, stems come from the base of the plant and so above it is stem and below it is root so that's uh, that's the point of, of that part now there's a couple things that are uh, useful about this or interesting to know and important to know one of them is that if you have a grafted plant 
one that is uh, different on the top end than it is on the bottom end. So they've uh, grafted that. And that applies to the uh, vast majority, um, particularly of bare root roses that you buy, um, is that genetically, above that area, it's one type of plant, and below the, the ground, in the, in the root area, it's a different plant. So if you see a big shoot coming from below the bud union, and it looks a lot different than the growth that you already have above the ground, that there is probably a rootstock sucker and should be eliminated. Uh, so I did a video on that a while back, uh, but uh, that's one thing that's important to know about the bud union. The other one is that it is the point at which your plant knows, or whether you would know, that the plant is alive or dead. So if a cane dies back to here, your plant is not dead. If it dies back to here, down to the bud union, and that turns black and diseased, your plant is gone, right? So it's the bud union that determines whether your plant is alive or dead. Okay, my final topic here is about the roots. Now I can't overemphasize how important the roots are to the health of your plant. Most of the time when I look at a plant in a greenhouse and I want to determine how healthy it is, first thing I do is take it out of its pot, tip it out, and I look at the roots. And on this one, this is a new, newly rooted cutting, you can see nice white roots, lots of growth there. It's almost filling the pot. It's well on its way. So when I'm taking cuttings, and I mentioned before, I take cuttings both semi-hardwood and hardwood, the first thing I do is I start trying to induce the formation of callus. Now, if you get in real close here, you can see that the bottom end of this cutting here is starting to develop the sort of white I'm going to call it scar tissue for, for lack of a better term. And uh, that's what callus is. It's the part that then will develop into the roots of your plants. So uh, feel free to look through some of my other videos for a full description on how to do cuttings on roses. Um, but uh, anyway, that should be the end of my description of roses for today, head to toe. If you have any questions, uh, please leave them in the comments below.